Okay, so I'm here today uh, for Latin Business Today with Tom Laidlaw, somebody uh, I've gotten to be very uh, friendly with, a, a, a great guy. We've uh, He's done a lot of stuff for us at Manhattanville College in our program there. Um, he is, uh, he, he's, he's just a genuinely good guy and unfortunately he played for the Rangers, but that's another conversation. <laughs> we'll and have- despite our differences there, you being an Islander fan, we still get along, yeah? Yeah, I mean, uh, you, you almost make me feel bad that I rooted against you, but you know, yeah. at, at the end of the day, um, you know, I have to say, um, you know, hockey guys are, are generally they seem to be good people. You know, a lot, a lot of friendly and, and and fun people I've met over the years in college athletics, and the hockey guys always seem to be good dudes. So yeah. uh, you would fall in that category. Um, Let's start, Tom, why don't, why don't we start at the beginning, as they say, your background, where you grew up, went to college, all, all that kind of stuff. Sure. I grew up on a small uh, dairy farm just outside of Toronto, a town called uh, Brampton, Ontario. And, uh, you know, I talk about a lot how important that upbringing, uh, excuse me, upbringing was for me, uh, because since that dairy farm, we couldn't afford to hire other people to work. So it was my father and grandfather. They'd get up every day, milk the cows twice a day. Um, you know, again, we couldn't afford to buy new equipment all the time. So they maintained the equipment meticulously. And uh, I say how lucky I was because I didn't realize it uh, uh, until later on in life. I really brought a lot of that mentality with me throughout my playing career and business career and, and personal life too, that kind of showing up every day and working hard. So I grew up on the farm. Um, uh, when I was uh, when I was like geez, 18, I got a, a scholarship to go play hockey at Northern Michigan University. That was 1976. So the first year they had a hockey team there was the first year I went there. So I was fortunate. I got to be a four-year captain, uh, which you know, most guys don't get an opportunity to do. Um, so we started the program in 1976. By the time my senior year came around, we were ranked number one in the country and actually went to the championship game of Providence, Rhode Island. Unfortunately, lost to North Dakota. Um, and, but it was still a great ride to, to take it from, you know, really, I guess the worst program in the country to the best in four years. And then I was, I'd, after actually my uh, sophomore year, I'd been drafted by the New York Rangers. So I, I finished my college career off. And then I started done college. I came to New York and uh, started playing with the Rangers. Actually, they brought me in after my senior year was done to play in the playoffs with, with the uh, New Haven Nighthawks, um, who are not there anymore. They've even torn down the building there now. Um, and so playing the playoffs, and that was a great opportunity for me. It really gave me uh, you know, a feel of what the pro game was like. Came back in the next year at the training camp and made the Rangers. and Played for the Rangers for seven years and then got traded to Los Angeles. Um, and uh, we, had a, we had a good team there, but it just it was Los Angeles, and really nobody was that interested in hockey. It, it was a good following, but then I was very fortunate. Wayne Gretzky got traded there, uh, I guess, a year after I got traded there. And uh, we became uh, like a rock band. Um, it, it was uh, movie stars at all the games. It was the place to be. Uh, so again, I was so fortunate. I started off in a great city like New York, loved playing with the Rangers at Madison Square Garden, losing to your Islanders all the time, unfortunately, because they were in the middle of one of their Stanley Cups. And uh, then when I got, like I said, I got traded out to LA and I now got to play with Wayne Gretzky and how it just, the whole scene of what, it wasn't just Wayne and how he played, but it was everything that came with him. So that was fantastic. When I got done playing, I got into the agent business, uh, represented players for just hockey players for 22 years. Uh, five of those years, I was with IMG, which was the largest management company in the world at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, and then once I got done the agent business, I've, uh, I've gotten off into motivational speaking and uh, doing podcasts and a book. I was fortunate to be on the, the TV show Survivor, season 39. Um, and we, I have another small company too. Where we do because of our network of athletes, we're we're tied in with all. We have access to people that manage big funds, multi-billion-dollar funds, and we meet people that maybe are doing an oil deal or a real estate deal and they need money for these deals. So we we're kind of like matchmakers for those uh, those people. So that's a kind of a side business. It can be pretty lucrative, but it's a uh, it's one of those businesses too. It's kind of lumpy, you know. You could, you could go for years without getting a deal done, but if you do get one deal done, it's a pretty big payday too. So, right, right. so that's me now. It's uh, I live the whole discipline. My company is called True Grit Life. We get up at three thirty every morning, uh, eat all healthy foods, go for a march, uh, four o'clock, lift weights. And it's funny, you know. Like I, I get more. Like a lot of people I hear, you know, it's tough for a lot of people during this quarantine time. Uh, you know, they're not at a gym, they're down the dumps. But for me, it's, again, because I've gotten into this whole discipline, motivational world, I actually think that I've gotten more out of it for this time off. I've gotten an opportunity to, you know, improve my workouts, you know, my discipline, my concentrating more on my workouts. I have this thing called uh, 
you know, putting your mind into the muscles. So when you're working out, you're like, you're totally focused mm -hmm. and it's, uh, it's been amazing. Cause again, it really helps me at home too, because there's nobody else around. So I, you know, as much as it's just a tough time, obviously people have lost their lives with the, you know, the virus and everything. Mm -hmm. I think, and I, I try to say to people, you know, take this opportunity to get better. You've got this opportunity at home now where maybe you have more time to do things instead of just sitting yeah. around and feel sorry for yourself. It is tough. There's no question, but, yeah. but I found that I've got more out of this uh, quarantine than maybe I, I would have in the previous two months. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you there. I, it's, I think uh, I'm actually cleaning the garage out, which, you know, is 30 years in the making. So when you have 30 yeah. years of yeah. junk and kids, yeah. toys, you know, and you sit yeah. there and you oh, wow, I wish I could do that. Well, you're right. There's no excuse now. It's a small yeah. thing, but it's a, it's a win for me. So it is true, right? I mean, that, that, kind, that kind of stuff that, the, the kind of stuff that you you sit there and look at and you see it every day and say, okay, sooner or later I've got to get to it, but you never do it. And then finally you do. Yeah. Right. And that's fantastic. Yeah. So um, let, let's go back uh, first to the hockey career. Uh, the, the years with the Rangers, obviously, um, you know, some good teams and some, uh, you know, you, you played for a coach, uh, one of your coaches at least, who uh, was fresh off of a, uh, we're celebrating the 40th year anniversary of this year, the, the winning of the gold medal in uh, Lake Placid with the big win over the yep. Russians. Obviously, that wasn't the, the gold medal game, but a guy from that team, Kenny Morrow, played for the Islanders and, and won four cups right after winning that gold medal. But you, uh, uh, you played for Herb Brooks. Why don't you talk about that for a second? Yeah, well, that was one of those experiences, uh, not unlike, you know, when I look back at growing up on the farm, you don't realize all the things you're learning from, my, particularly my father and grandfather. Uh, it, it's later on in life, you, think, you kind of look back and go, wow, you know, this is why I am the way I am, right? This is why I'm able to accomplish things or, you know, make mistakes and recover. And Herb's the same way, you know, when, he, when I coached him, there's times where, to be honest, I hated him. You know, he just was... Like he was always hard, always pushing you to get the most out of yourself. And you don't, as a young person, you don't always see that, that he's doing you a favor, right? Because you, all you see is the hard part. Um, I tell a story. Uh, and it's, so Herb, I had my rookie year. Then Herb came in to coach my second year with the Rangers. And Herb was really like always prepared and always like thinking he had planning and speeches and everything. And um, so we'd had our last practice before the regular season was going to start. And two, the next day was going to be Herb Brooks's first regular season game in the National Hockey League. So we're at our practice rink in Ryan, New York at Wright Playland. And he pulls the whole team together at center ice. And he's uh, giving a big speech about, you know, Barry Beck, this is what I expect of you. You're the captain, you're a leader. Ron Greshner, you're our power play guy. Ron Duguay, you can fly up and down the ice. And then he gets to me near the end and he goes, Laidlaw, when you get the puck, give it to somebody else. You're not supposed to have it. And uh, the guys were dying laughing because I mean, like, I had a good rookie year. You know, I had like 30 points or whatever. And I, you know, I'm like, now I'm going to take another step forward. And he's basically saying to me, like, just get the puck to somebody else. <laughs> so I was devastated at the time, but that was one of those things that you look back at in, uh, in a strange kind of way in Herb's world, it was a compliment because he thought I was mentally tough enough mm -hmm. to take it, right? That he was kind of using me as an example uh, knowing that you know, maybe I wouldn't get it right away, but eventually it paid off. And, and it was, you know, the way he treated me too, you know, he never, like, he, he would really get to understand each player and, and he would treat them all differently. Like, he wouldn't just come in and say, okay, this is the way I coach. He yeah. wouldn't understand each guy and what really gets him going. Um, so for me, like, he knew um, from talking to other coaches and getting to know me, like, I, I wanted to have that role, you know, that I was, and I, and I was fine. I didn't have to be the star player. And it's funny because he knew this before I did, right? He was, he was able to figure it all out. Um, and then my role was to be that defensive player. But it's also, it isn't just saying, okay, you're going to be the defensive player. It's really rewarding you for being that good defensive player at certain times during games. Right. So like he would come down, if we had a, if we had a big game at say against the Islanders at Madison Square Garden and we're winning 2-1 and it's 30 seconds to go and we need to kill a penalty. You know, like some of those games you played like on a, a playoff day, you know, you're, you're losing 10 pounds of water weight. You're beat up, you know, Clark Gillies and Bob Nystrom, you're butting heads with those guys all game long. Um, and he would come down to me, you know, and you're tired, right? And you don't know if you got much left. And he would come down and literally kick me in the rear end and say, get, you know, get the F out there, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think back and I said, it was kind of, other guys were like, what's all that about? But to me, like he didn't ask me how I was. Because yeah. he didn't, like, he, all he knew was that I, I wanted to know that he wanted me out there doing the job didn't matter if I was 100% or 70%, he wanted me. So that's like how he kind of rewarded me for being that, that good defensive player. And when he would do that, like the adrenaline would pump through me. 
Like, cause I knew, okay, he doesn't care how I am. He just wants me on the ice, no matter how I, how I am. Right. So like, you know, that just got me fired up. Uh, so that's the kind of stuff that Herb would do. Like he would have sayings like, you know, passes come from the heart. Um, and he would literally be me- meaning that in like in a practice setting where you're, you're kind of throwing the puck, you know, halfway, you're not going all out. Mm-hmm. And uh, he would, he would get down and like, he, he'd, like squeeze the stick and say, no, passes come from the heart. Meaning you can put your heart into it. Mm-hmm. Don't hope that it happens, make it happen. And again, it's another one of those things that like, I really believe, yes, he meant it, the actual act of passing, but it's also how you lead your life too. Yeah. It's like, okay, don't hope that something is going to happen, make it happen. So that's the kind of stuff with Herb that, you know, at the time when he's t- teaching you the stuff, you don't totally get it. And then later on in life, the, kind of like the light bulb goes off, you know, oh, geez, that's what he's talking about. You know, and how he, you know, he kind of built me into, like, he, he played a huge role in building me what I am today. You know, it's very interesting. You know, I've heard you tell that story before, and it just struck me. And if you, you know, watching the movie, how they portrayed him in the movie, and how, you know, remember when he, when he had the roster, and they were appalled because it's like they had a whole week of trials, and he, but he knew, he said, I know my team. And that, what yeah. you're saying is exactly, he knew the type of guys he wanted. He knew their backgrounds. He knew, you know, the work ethic, and it, for lack of a better word, and that's what you had. So he probably knew your background as, you know, as yeah. a, a farmer, a farm boy, whatever the term is, you know, from, and, and he knew you could handle it. So that's actually really yeah. kind of cool. Yeah. yeah, it is. And that, and that was Herb too. Like, you know, that's one of the things I've learned uh, from other people, but Herb was one of those first guys that I learned from, like his preparation was impeccable. Like he would, uh, so my first year working here in the league, we didn't have a great regular season. Herb, uh, Freddie Shiro had gotten fired halfway through the year. Craig Patrick, who was Herb's assistant coach, uh, because of his background and his family's background with the Rangers, they basically handed him the whole team, coach, general manager and everything. Uh, but we, so we just squeaked in the playoffs and then had a long run in the, in, uh, in the playoffs, went to the semifinals and lost to the Islanders on the way to win their second cup. Um, so typically when you do that, well, you don't come in and change a lot of players. You usually keep the team together, but Herb was coming in and we'd had a big, tough physical team and that wasn't Herb's game at all. So now Herb's coming into the team, getting rid of a lot of the big, tough physical guys and bringing in smaller guys like Mark Pavlich or Robbie McClanahan and guys like the rare roots of Lane and, they were like skaters, great players, but totally different than what we had. So you would think, you know, I, I, most coaches would come in and the players would be like, you know, what's going on here? We just almost won the Stanley Cup and now you're changing the team. But when Herb came in the room, he was so prepared about what he was going to say, what the plan was for the year, how we were going to play, how each player was going to play, who was going to be in each role. And he would talk to us. And when you left the meeting, you're like, okay, I guess, you know, instead of being like, what the heck happened to last year's team? You're like, yeah. okay, let's go. We're going to win the Stanley Cup here with this guy. Like he really was that prepared. And, you know, I'm sure maybe he was, it's like, you know, they talk about the ducks sitting on the water, right? You know, he's floating along. He looks like he's nice and cool and calm, but the feet are going hundred miles an hour underneath. And maybe Herb was like that inside, but man, his preparation and his, like the way he spoke to you again, like I really think he gave himself a license to be that confident and exude that confidence to everybody else that he knew what he was doing. There's no, it wasn't a democracy. It wasn't, he wasn't asking for anybody's opinion. He was the dictator. He was going to do it his way. And you felt like, okay, he's, this guy's got a plan. So 